Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm glad you all got your food in and you know getting settled. So yeah, thanks for joining us everyone. Southeast Asia's digital economy has blossomed over the past decade showing investors all around the world how lucrative it is to invest in this region. Although the exuberance has died down a little bit from past years, we are seeing a new crop of companies come up, one, ones that are more stable and sustainable. Um, so as we move forward, as we move into this new era, maybe Paragung, you can start us off. Um, where do you see the venture playbook as well evolving um, and Fleur just closed a $72 million fund. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you said you're going to invest in 45 companies over the next nine months. Super, super busy time for you, right? So what are you looking for in terms of founders and what's exciting you now? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So uh, again, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit uh, starstruck by Pa Esbe because I've been <laughs> sitting in the classroom seeing his face for the past 10 years. Uh, so, thank you, Pa. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, to answer uh, the question, um, Antler itself, as we have a DNA, a, a more founder DNA. So, uh, and me, myself, I was a startup founder uh, seven years ago. Um, and then most of the partners at Antler is mostly operator. Mm -hmm. and, and we really look at this condition today where everyone says it's you know, a hard time to build a company. Uh, more from the grassroots perspective. Because uh, like, you know, capital funding might be tough, mm. but problem is still here, <laughs> right? Uh, consumer will, will still here. Uh, business will find problem. And then innovation is also always here. So what we're looking at here today, especially in Indo, we, we also want to wanna, wanna see more Indonesian founders uh, build global solutions. Uh, and we've been, we've been investing in different kind of solutions where it can be a B2B solutions, could be a B2C consumer product. Um, but we, we are seeing more and more cross-border solutions where, you know, in the past, maybe a lot of companies like my, my, my last company was primarily only focused on Indo. Then uh, nowadays, I think the border is less prevalent. Mm. And I think also thanks to the growth of economy um, and also, you know, the, 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 not only the physical infrastructure, but, but, but also regulations and, and, and support that, uh, that could, we call an infrastructure that can help a lot of founders, a lot of entrepreneurs to build easily regional solutions. Yeah, exactly. I think um, the borders kind of blurring between the nations is something that we're very happy to have here in ASEAN. So I think, Paul, you've you know, invested all across Southeast Asia and built a name as a very sharp, deep tech investor in the region. Actually, what do, do founders or companies have to do to navigate this climate? Do you have any tips? What should be avoided and where, where are the opportunities? Yeah, um, so yeah, they, I think they're calling uh, the tougher fundraising environment we have today funding winter, right? Oh. Because interest rates have gone up. Um, if you look historically, I think that if you look at the last 50 years, interest rates are probably closer to where they are now than they were to the 0 to 1% that we had for many years. And in some sense, you can say this is good for the ecosystem because you know, when money is relatively free, um, you know, certain <laughs> bad behaviors emerge and, and people become too aggressive, maybe too enamored for growth for, for nothing. Um, the second thing I, I guess I'd look at is because we invest primarily in B2B startups, right, which has not really been the most popular theme in the region. We've invested in 200 um, companies, about 90% are B2B. So they've always had a harder time to fundraise. They're, they're typically less sexy. They don't grow as fast. But one of the things that they do quite well is they focus on creating value mm. rather than chasing valuation. So when, when, when the funding environment is tough, like it is today, it typically um, triggers what I think is a flight to quality. And if you think about probably our most successful startup in Indonesia is a company called eFishery. It's not something that was quite obvious at the time when we invested in 2018, who cared about aquaculture in Indonesia. But they've grown since then. When we invested, they were less than 
uh, $2 million a year in revenue. Now they're approaching a billion. They've always been positive EBITDA. But more importantly, they've really helped farmers. Mm. The typical farmer, before they work with e-fishery, maybe makes $1,000 of profit per pound per year. But with working with e-fishery, we've seen that double to 2,000, maybe even 2,500. So I guess for founders today, what I would just say is just focus on solving a real problem. Find an insight that not too many people have. Do it in a differentiated way, but do it in a scalable, sustainable, defensible way. And investors, even in tough environments, will always look for big, they'll always look for good deals, mm -hmm. right? And so if you want investors to be interested, instead of chasing valuation, chase value. Chase value, indeed. Okay, Helen, let me jump to you real quick because um, AC Ventures is one of the kingpins in Indonesia, right? So let's, let's focus a little bit there. And um, you've built a strong rep for identifying some of the fastest growing digital disruptors here. Where is the money to be made, in your opinion? What is Indonesia strong in and what does Indonesia have a competitive advantage in? Sure, thank you, um, Olivia. I would say that um, Indonesia, for sure, the consumer market is very exciting. Um, 270 million in population and you know, rising middle class. So we've seen um, some of uh, the investments that we've made, like the digital native brands, uh, have actually grown very quickly over the last few, few years, uh, doubling or tripling in sales, and also achieving profitability at the same time. Um, and we've also seen very rapid growth of offline retailer. Uh, for example, we've just invested in a company called 707, mm. uh, which is a distributor of very popular brands such as um, OnCloud, you know, the running shoes brand, um, as well as uh, other brands like Fred Perry, Melissa. And they've been growing very nicely and very profitably. So we're quite excited about you know, both offline and online brands. Um, and the other trend that we're seeing is uh, on the climate and sustainability side, mm. um, which, as you know, you know Indonesia, uh, for example, has certain advantages in, for example, electric vehicles, uh, in the supply chain of electric vehicles, I should say, because Indonesia has the largest uh, reserve of uh, nickel, mm. which is a key component for electric vehicle batteries. And you can see that the supply chain is now being built out in Indonesia, uh, starting from you know, the mining to the processing of the minerals to the you know, back battery cells and then to the you know, electric vehicles themselves. And I think in the future, we see battery recycling as well as a big opportunity. So I think that uh, would be one sector that we are, uh, have been investing and uh, continue to keep an eye on. Right, so three main themes, um, consumer market, um, climate tech, and... Within climate, e EV, yeah, yes, EV. electric vehicles, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, David, now I'm going to move to you. And Jungle is one of the biggest VC firms in the region. You have lots of unicorns under your belt. Um, so let's move the conversation a bit further upstream and talk about exit opportunities. Um, the global IPO markets are the best right now, and lots of unicorns in the region are kind of sitting and waiting, you know, getting their ducks in a row. Um, where, where do you see some of the exit opportunities come up in the next um, short term, the next few years? And when do you think we can um, expect more of these unicorns to, to go to the public markets? Sure. So in the companies that we tend to invest in as a group, there tends to be two main paths to liquidity. It's either m and or it's the public markets. And I think as you think about Southeast Asia, uh, as a comparison to say the US or China or other more advanced or mature venture ecosystems, a lot of the m and had come from the large players in those ecosystems. Whether they were buying their way into new businesses or new adjacencies or adding new technology or new teams. And really, that hasn't happened as much in Southeast Asia. And I think part of the reason for that is these large companies, whether it's SEA or whether it's a Gojack or whether it's a Grab, have been very inward focused, building their margin structures, getting to profitability, building scale, solidifying their core businesses. I think you'll start to see that change over the next 12, 24 months. And I think you'll start to see more M&A start to happen in this part of the world. The other path is the public market path. And China wouldn't be what it is without A shares. NASDAQ really helped drive liquidity for Silicon Valley. 
And I think one of the ways that Southeast Asia has struggled and will continue to struggle is there is no natural public market exchange. So I think Singapore and the SGX has not proven to be a very viable exchange, both from a liquidity perspective and to be the ability to attract technology companies. As I think about an opportunity for Indonesia uh, going forward, um, as Pak said, you know, most businesses are looking to become regional businesses in Southeast Asia. Uh, founders are trying to get the largest addressable markets that they can. So they're expanding into Vietnam and into other markets. Because of the scale and size of Indonesia, it will inherently be one of the largest businesses in a group of companies. So if you have a company that's a regional company, Indonesia will probably be the largest component, the largest driver of revenue for that business, which makes the Indonesian Stock Exchange a potential very attractive venue for listing that business. Um, I think there needs to be some policy changes. There can be some regulatory changes. Um, but I think that's not unachievable. I think that's a very big opportunity for Indonesia to attract technology companies to become the more dominant public market exchange in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think that uh, will be something that will evolve over the next two, three, four, five years going forward. Very nice. And we've seen some tech companies list in Indonesia. I think um, GoTo and Bukalapak are some of these. Um, I cover these companies quite extensively. So GoTo is not, not at its, um, it's 80% down from, from its peak. So is, will that kind of deter new tech companies from stepping forward as an investor? How, how are companies and founders navigating this? Well, I think part of it comes back to the quality of the business. Mm. And so I think there is a cohort of companies that were probably founded in the 2015 to 2018 vintage, which I think are very strong businesses. They're private companies today. They've had phenomenal growth. They have very strong market positions. They have good margin structures. I think as we see more of those companies starting to go public, then I think you have a much broader kind of cohort of companies that will attract investor interest. Well said. Okay, Paul, let's jump to you if you'd like to weigh in. I think, um, I mean, you're based in Singapore, and SGX has recently been kind of um, implementing a lot of new measures to, to revive, in hopes of reviving the stock market. Between Indonesia and Singapore, or even Southeast Asia, where do you think is the, the brightest spot? Yeah, that, um, that's a work in progress, if we're going to be honest, right? Um, again, taking off from, from David's theme. Uh, if we're going to be honest, when money was free, many of our startups might have gotten overfed with money. And when you're overfed with money, the valuations tend to be mm. probably a little optimistic. And when you try to go to public markets, the public investors' lens will probably be a little different. And so that's why you know, we need a cohort of companies, mm. as David said, that have real businesses, that have realistic valuations, with still a path to growth mm. and, um, and you know, sources of sustainable competitive advantage. That's kind of one side of it. The other side of it is you need investors who will take the time to understand these companies mm. because they might not look like companies that they've seen in other parts of the world. So to David's point, there's probably no one solution as of today. Um, the local markets where these companies operate will probably the be the first place they're going to look because the assumption is the local markets will understand these companies and be able to value them a little bit better. Um, the SGX is, you know, put together a review board. Um, I've been privileged to join kind of one of the work streams looking at it. And one of the challenges that they have is really what the Singapore Stock Exchange stand for. Mm -hmm being so small, mm. right? And, and uh, one of the things I mentioned was, instead of asking the question, how do we fix the Singapore Stock Exchange? The question might be reframed as, how do we make the Singapore Stock Exchange the best in the world at something? Mm. And maybe that's the same thing for Indonesia, for the Philippines, for Thailand, for Vietnam. What can Indonesia be the best in the world at? what kinds of companies are uniquely Indonesian. Mm. 
and then you will be able to find companies that match that and investors that will hopefully uh, give them the proper valuation as well. That's a great perspective. And I think um, a couple of all of your, your portfolio are in that kind of stage, you know, waiting to, to look at the, the public markets, eFishery, Zendit, and um, Credivo. Right, but I, I maybe want to pivot a little bit to where valuations are a bit higher at the moment, which is AI. Um, today, much has been said about the Magnificent Seven, if perhaps whoever owns the infrastructure, the data, the resources will win the AI race. But there's also another conversation to be had about finding these budding companies that can build applications on top of these resources. And that's where you guys are the, the experts in, right? Um, as we've seen previously from the mobile app era, where companies like ByteDance, Shopee, and GoTo have done, there's probably lots of money to be made there from an investor point of view. What are some trends in terms of talent flows and technology you see that can support this? And what are some signs that we're, we're heading in the right direction? Maybe Helen, you can start us off. <laughs> Well, um, personally, I think generative AI is very exciting, but um, I'm not sure it is a big area for uh, VCs to invest in this part of the world um, because I think a lot of the AI talent actually is residing in the US and in China. Um, and even in, in the US, right, you see this um, pool of talent being concentrated in the very few um, individuals, like the, you know, the deep mind mafia, they call them. Mm. Um, so I do think that in this part of the world, what is more interesting is the use and application of generative AI. Um, so, you know, in terms of what our companies are doing, is you see certain use cases that are, where generated AI can really make a difference. Uh, for example, you know, being a co-pilot for your coding, so helping to you know, make your engineers more efficient, and also in the chatbot for customer service, so making your customer service um, agents more efficient as well. Um, content creation for advertising or for your e-commerce um, you know, descriptions and things like that. So I think specific areas, we do see our companies leveraging generative AI to make it, you know, to make, uh, to make things more efficient. And the other part that I think is interesting about uh, generative AI is that it will lead to more, uh, you know, these more data centers, and these data centers are actually more power intensive. Mm. So the use of energy will go up, and with that, we are looking at, you know, more the, you know, renewable energy, climate solutions that would help to make these AI centers, data centers, more sustainable. So interesting, it all ties together. Then, Pak Agu, would you like to to weigh in? Yeah, maybe I'm, I'm going to try to look at it from a different perspective. What, what, what are the biggest thing that many people would not realize about AI is that it will uh, create a more, um, how to say it, massive outliers. And, and actually, that's the reason why Indo is very interesting, because we are the market of outliers, mm -hmm. right? E-fisheries, mm -hmm. outliers, right? Yeah. Um, most startups here are outliers. Uh, Indonesian is, you know, built by outliers. The, the nation itself is built by outliers, right? Um, all the great leaders is outliers. Um, it's you know, a story of nobody who's just work hard enough and 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 build become something is is is, is very common here. And yeah. AI enabled that because, uh, like nowadays, you know, with if you if we, you know, I, I'm always amazed with like uh, meeting like let's say uh, 12 years old who somehow uh, have a much better coding skill than, than me. Uh, wow. <laughs> because, just because they have an access, a much better access to, to Copilot, right? Mm. And they have much more uh, better access to, to, to a more high level programming language. And, and, and that actually, um, you know, uh, uh, just become more and more, uh, just double down, right? Every time, every, every time there's a, Let's say for you know GPT, you know enable something new, or uh, there's a more more uh, co-pilot solutions. There's more um, learning solutions. It just enable more and more kids mm. to build something. So I believe the opportunity would lies in in something that we might not see yet, uh, something that is not you know foreseeable very clearly, something that is. Uh, maybe very grassroots, something that uh, maybe people will not believe uh, it, it will be great or it will be good, uh, but somehow it can, you know, it changed the world, it changed 
the whole market uh, in the next 10 years. Mm. So AI, I believe, is, um, uh, is an enablement to, to uh, talents. Uh, and outliers especially. Yeah, definitely. Something to, to watch out then. Yeah. I'm sure all of you are keeping a very close eye on this. Yeah, we're, we're very scared. <laughs> <laughs> when the 12-year-old can cope better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I think one of some of the criticisms I've heard is that there's still lots and lots to digitize in Indonesia, right? Um, conversations that just a few years ago were centered on how to bring more of the country online. Um, with mobile phones and all that. Is it then um, a huge leap to expect a, the nation to be at the forefront of this generative AI technology? Where do you think uh, are the pockets of opportunity that Indonesia can capitalize on and leapfrog its, its peers? Maybe David, you'd like to start us off. Sure, and so the way that I think about AI is analogous to how I think about cloud computing. So mm. if you remember when cloud computing came out, it was transformative for companies mm. and it was ubiquitous. It enabled for massive amounts of scale, it massively lowered costs, it reduced complexity. And I think the implementation of AI will be very similar to that. And I think it will be leveraged across multiple industries. I think it will be used to drive more efficiency, it will drive more industry forward at a faster rate. I think from an investment perspective, from a business model perspective, it becomes challenging because the business model of a building an AI company is much more like analogous to say an uh, enterprise software company because you're going to globally compete. And so if you're an engineer sitting in Silicon Valley and you're looking for a coding co-pilot, you're gonna use the best copilot you can find. It doesn't matter where the team's based or where the company comes from. It's the best one that you wanna use. And so as you start to build in the AI space, you really have to compete globally. And so in this region, I think we've proven that we can build globally scalable, globally best in class businesses, but it is very, very challenging in the same way that it's very challenging to build an enterprise software, global enterprise software business in this part of the world. Yeah, that's such a that's such a good point because as as you know they build faster and faster, I think maybe the venture investing space might also change as with all all the industries, right? How are you guys thinking about you know navigating the space forward? Um, how is the venture playbook inv um, venture investing playbook evolving? Paul? Yeah. So maybe I'll be a little. You know, different. <laughs> um, we, we tend to invest in things, we're more in, interested in things when they're not so hot. Mm. So for example, all of this rage around generative AI probably is why we're not really investing in that space. I've, I've invested in AI in, in 2015 and, and David was talking about trying to build a global enterprise company. We're trying, we're in year nine. Um, but it's AI for anti-money laundering, and, and the customers are the likes of Standard Chartered and HSBC, and they're global, and they're out of Singapore and Poland. It's a slog, but I think um, if they win, they can win really big. If you look at a lot of the generative stuff, aside from what David's mentioned, that it's, it's kind of analogous to the cloud. When, when cloud came out, it was so sexy. My startup is a cloud startup. Today, it's table stakes, right? And so generative AI for me is, is kind of like, I think it will be table stakes. The question you have to ask, is it a feature? Is it a product? Mm. Is it a company in itself? Is this one of the few times where the large companies are paying attention, right? And they have distribution power. So you think about Microsoft, Google, SAP, Oracle, all of these guys are paying attention. They can just put in their software with AI, and it's going to be very difficult for a startup anywhere to compete against that. So that's why I'm saying it just goes back to, again, what do I like is, is, is insights. I like to start with, as, I think as Peter Thiel says, what important truth do you believe that few people agree with you on? Mm. Right? When something is so obvious that everybody's going there, that's kind of harder because it becomes an efficiently priced market, if not an overpriced market. As venture investors, we're looking for the alpha. Mm. So we're looking for stuff that people probably underestimate as long as we can build the conviction that the actual value created can be big. So I, I don't want to put a label or I don't want to put a playbook beyond that. Right. That's kind of what we're hunting for. 
So it's still back to fundamentals, trying to find the companies that can leverage that, that alpha. Helen, what, what about you? What do you think? Um, table stakes or not? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure, table stakes. Yes. We encourage all our companies to use generative AI to leverage it as much as possible. And we have seen a lot of um, advancements, right? Mm. I mean, I saw a company uh, that was doing um, selling insurance and they had the sales agent talk to this customer for 20 minutes. Um, but actually, the sales agent is a bot. Um, oh. But it was so real that the customer didn't realize and could just go on and on, you know, um, chatting like we're chatting now, like, you know, how's your, how old is your daughter? You know, maybe you should consider this insurance policy for her. But it was a bot. <laughs> and I was really amazed by that. So I think um, definitely, you know, there's a lot of improvements in the space and very exciting. And so we can leverage that to make our companies uh, more efficient. Yeah, that's a bit scary, honestly. Um, how about you, Park Agung? Uh, what kind of roadblocks do you think um, we uh, are facing in this you know, generative AI race or we can work on today? Roadblock. Um, I, I would maybe say, I think, I think th this is the, the place where, where maybe some of the businesses will have a different shape, mm. meaning that maybe, maybe traditionally if you look at let's say an enterprise um, software company have uh, you know, a few hundred engineers, then maybe it's gonna be a different kind of structure these days uh, with this kind of company. And, and then, then also a different kind of way of sales, different kind of way of organizing. So, because we, 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 we're seeing, you know, um, also, also there's also a challenge of, of being um, obsolete much faster. Because I think, because yeah. if you remember it correctly, right, like, uh, what, like five, seven years ago, it was a craze about chatbot. You know, everyone wanted to build Bahasa Indonesia chatbot. And then one night, GPT mm. released, then everyone just, you know, sit in the ground, right? Uh, and and this, this probably could happen even faster and even uh, more prevalent. Um, and it could come from different, you know, um, uh, uh, sites as well. So, so, so may, I guess I guess many many uh, things with 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 AI driven or AI um, related company, um, there's a there's a bit of a challenge because this is a sort of like a, a new animal for all of us. I guess again, this is also uh, um, what happened in the past with when once uh, a cloud service was also there. Mm -hmm. Uh, things are, you know, because I was educated at the time where cloud service was, you know, not not a <laughs> not a not a main, mainstream. And then a uh, few years, then you know, I have to relearn that. And then my juniors just become much better than than, than me in in, in managing uh, infrastructure, right? So, yeah. so so I think this is this this happened much faster and and much prevalent. So again again uh, maybe you know. Organization is going to be challenging. Mm. Competition is going to be a bit more broad. Um, you know, you know, founders could come from places that we 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 never uh, guess, right? Uh, and and of course, today, um, you know, coding a Flappy Bird it's is is probably a line of prompt. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so quick, uh, but. I mean, that brings us back, right? Like, as a venture investor, then how do you hedge your bets in this, like, crazy, fast-evolving environment? David, do you want to um, take a I, stab at it? <laughs> for us, we're a little bit like Paul, where I, I think we're a little bit contrarian, and so I don't, I don't think you want to try and bet where all the momentum's going, particularly in a space that has such large players. I think mm. where we've probably spent more time with our portfolio companies is getting helping them to adopt AI as part of their business. And so whether it's efficiency gains on collections, uh, in the case of Credivo, a mm. lot of their collections is now uh, AI driven, whether it's you know uh, Sleek, which is one of our companies that does bookkeeping, whether it's helping the bookkeepers and the accounting process become more efficient. And so I think you can get a lot more scalability for companies uh, leveraging AI today. I think one of the places which is probably a window in time opportunity is that there is some competitive advantage around uh, language and around mm. vernacular. So if you think about, you know, marge, most large language models are in English or 
Chinese uh, increasingly, but as you think about India where you have hundreds of dialects um, and you have call centers that are trying to serve all of these people, you know, having some vernacular focus I think probably creates some competitive advantage, but like I said, I think that's probably a window in time opportunity until the, it all kind of catches up. But for us, it's much more around helping our companies get better margin structures, get more scale, leveraging technology. Mm. It does sounds like the foundation is extremely, extremely important at a, at a time like this, right? So I think um, I'd like to close us off with one last question, and it's a very simple one. What is your hope and what are you um, excited about in the next five to ten years? Maybe we can go down the line. Helen, let's start with you. <laughs> sure, I think uh, I already talked about it. Like, mm. I'm still very excited about the consumer market because I do see tremendous growth opportunities there. Um, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we see like, for example, retail is still underpenetrated, mm. especially in the you know, outer islands. Um, and then I would say climate and sustainability because you know we really do see a lot of opportunities. Uh, for example, solar energy. You know we just announced a big uh, financing round for one of our portfolio companies, Surya. Um, you know so I think that that is one. And electric vehicles. I mentioned waste management, um, climate resilient agriculture as well. We see as a big opportunity. So I think there's there's quite a lot that we can invest in this space. Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess as a young ecosystem, we like to look up to those that were a little more ahead of us, whether it's the US, China, mm -hmm. and we end up, I guess, creating very local, regional versions of their successes. So, so my hope for the next few years is, is to really create companies that are based on Southeast Asian insights, Southeast Asian problems, Southeast Asian approaches, so that we can have kind of world firsts coming from here and create our own models of success. Thanks. David? Um, I, I, I think this is probably the most exciting region to be building a tech business today. I think Southeast Asia inherently has a lot of complexity. Every country has a different currency, different regulatory environment, different language. There is still an enormous amount of friction in the way things operate. I think there's a lot of underlying infrastructure and plumbing that hasn't been built uh, across the region. And so I think there's a lot of advancement that you're going to see. There's a lot of growth that will happen. And so I think that's the thing that probably excites us the most. Mm. I think uh, for, for us, I think it's how, uh, how do you call this? Um, generation spirit is something that we're super excited. Because like, as, as you guys mentioned, right? B2B is changing. Uh, a consumer is changing. Uh, technology itself is changing. So uh, we believe that the, as the new generation is getting more productive and more productive, things are also developing into something new, right? That's, that's one thing that we are, and Southeast Asia, of course, is the, on the forefront of, of the innovations because our productive populations is, is, is big. And, um, you know, it's, it's very, very, you know, exciting for us because solutions such as, because uh, like we, we've been leapfrogging on, 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 on mobile phones and mobile phone services, and then we're probably gonna not do another leapfrog in, in something else. Uh, so that is, that is really exciting for us. So we, we are excited for something that is unknown. Very well said. Okay, thank you all for your insights today and giving us, us something to chew on besides the food. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.